How long should a stanza be? Should I capitalize my poetry? And what the heck is enjambment? Hey guys, my name is Dr. Katie Yales, and I am part of the team here at I Am Loud Productions. Welcome to Form Fundamentals. This is our mini-series in which we break down the essentials of poetic form. This episode is all about structure, the varying strategies for building and formatting your poetry. You can watch episode one, defining and going over the purposes of form, linked up in the eye, and stay tuned for the next two episodes on rhyme and meter. Form Fundamentals kicks off season two of our Return to Form project, which celebrates poetic form and shows how contemporary writers can use it in new and innovative ways, as well as giving you guidance on how to use form yourself. Big thanks to National Lottery Funding through Creative Scotland for making this project possible. Check out all of the videos in the Return to Form playlist linked up in the eye. In this episode, I'll be breaking down the essentials of poetic structure to help you to understand the mechanics of poetry and thus how to build it yourself. First, I'll define the basic unit of poetry, the line, and I'll explain what enjambment means. Next, I'll go over the other major unit in poetry, the stanza, and I'll also review the different terms for different stanza lengths. From there, we'll explore the many, many options of laying poetry out on the page, from the classical to the experimental. Finally, I'll talk you through the various strategies for punctuating your poetry and how that can affect the meaning and tone of a poem. Before we dive into all that, though, a quick note. In today's episode, I'm going to primarily be focusing on how poems are structured on the page, how they're laid out, rather than focusing on how poetry can be structured through live performance. The question of page versus stage is a whole nother video, but to briefly generalize, the relationship between how a poem is structured on the page and how it's performed aloud is not always linear. One doesn't always determine the other. First, you're not required to read a poem aloud the way that it appears on the page. You don't have to pause at every line break or take a break after every stanza, for instance. You can if you want, but that's a personal choice. Secondly, for us spoken word poets, if we are interested in publishing our work in print, there are so many fascinating creative ways of trying to represent the dynamics and the energy of live performance in how a poem is visually laid out and printed on the page. For example, my good friend and the acclaimed spoken word poet Carly Brown has a fantastic book called Grown Up Poetry Needs to Leave Me Alone, which plays with the size and the weight of font and how lines are arranged on the page to try to convey some of Carly's brilliant, dynamic, character-driven performance style. So keep in mind as we go through the basics of poetic structure in this video that performing poetry aloud just multiplies the possibilities for structure, and there is so much fun to be had in the intersection between page and performance. All right, with all of that said, let's dive in. To start off, let's go over some basic terms used to describe poetic structure, beginning with the line. The line is the most fundamental unit of poetry. Simply put, it's a line on the page before the poet moves down to the next line on the paper or hits enter on their computer. That place where the poet has moved down to the next line, has hit enter, is known as the line break, where one line is broken and a new line begins. When you're writing in a set meter, sometimes the length of a line is defined by that meter. For example, in a line of iambic pentameter, you need to have 10 syllables, five of which are stressed syllables. We'll go over all of that in the fourth episode of Form Fundamentals on meter. Now, you might be thinking of a single line of poetry as a single sentence or a single phrase, and often that is the case. These kinds of lines, which complete a single thought and often have a period or some other punctuation at the end of them, are called end stopped lines because you stop, you pause at the end of them. Our example poem, The Kiss by Callum O'Dwyer, begins with an end-stopped line. First off, we promised this, a final kiss. It's a full sentence, ending in a full stop. But you can absolutely have a single sentence, phrase, or idea which spills over multiple lines. 
That is what's known in poetry terms as enjambment. We get the word enjambment from the French enjambé, which means stepping over or straddling. So I like to imagine a tiny person stepping over from one line of poetry to the next line. Again referring to our example poem, the second line uses enjambment as it rolls on to the third line. We are a rolling wave approaching land and cresting. To read that as a sentence, there's no pause, no punctuation between land and and. The line just carries on, steps over, straddles, and jams. The same is true for line three, rolling into line four here. But still, there's this preemptive loss. Okay, so why use enjambment? Well, think of it this way. A poem which doesn't use enjambment can just have one sentence or one phrase per line. That's fine, and many poems are written that way, but it can tend to get a little bit samey, a little bit monotonous, and it doesn't allow the poet the same freedom to use sentences and phrases of varying length all the way throughout their poem. Also, as we can see in Callum's poem here, you can strategically use enjambment to create some interesting effects playing on the reader's expectations. Take the end of line three. But still, there's this. And the line ends. This what? The reader has a split second here before moving to the next line to wonder, what is this? And then we get it. Preemptive loss. You can also play with how you perform in jammed lines. You could roll right through, but still there's this preemptive loss. Or you could take a brief pause at the line break, but still there's this preemptive loss. There's no hard or fast rule here. Have a play around with enjambment in your poetry and see what effects you can create. And if you want to take your writing to the next level, you can even use enjambment in the middle of a word. In my workshop on the Golden Shovel from season one of Return to Form, I showed how Terence Hayes' original Golden Shovel plays with form by enjamming in the middle of words, as you can see here. There is a lot of fun to be had in splicing up your lines. Have a play around. Okay, so we've gone over the definition of a line and some guidance on how to creatively break lines. Say you want to put a couple of those lines together. What's that called? That is a stanza. It can also be called a verse, like it is in music. After the line, the stanza is the next major unit in a poem. If there's blank space before it and after it, that's a stanza. There are different names for stanzas with different numbers of lines, too. A stanza of two lines is a couplet, three is a tercet, four is a quatrain, five is a quintain or quintet, six is a sestet, seven is a septet, and eight is an octave or octet. There are more terms for longer stanzas, but these are the most commonly used. Some established poetic forms require you to write in stanzas of particular lengths. For example, standard habi requires you to write in sestets, stanzas of six lines each. But when you're writing a poem, particularly if you're using free form, you don't have to stick with only stanzas of the same length, all couplets, all octets, etc. You can mix and match as you choose. This is also true for poetry in established forms. For example, a villanelle is composed of five tercets with a concluding quatrain, five stanzas of three lines each with a concluding stanza that is four lines long. Similarly, a Shakespearean sonnet also mixes up its stanza lengths. Let's check out what that looks like by returning to our example poem by Callum O'Dwyer. Shakespearean sonnets have a strict rhyme scheme which organizes the poem into these three quatrains and a final concluding couplet. When Callum wrote this poem, though, he didn't include stanza breaks. He ran those quatrains directly into each other so that on the page, the poem appears as one 12-line stanza and one couplet. And this illustrates an important point. If you're writing in a set poetic form, the rhyme scheme may dictate how the end words of stanzas are laid out, but it's up to you how to lay out your poems on the page. I love the choice Callum made here to smush the first 12 lines together and separate out the final two. Those first 12 lines are about the lead up to lovers parting, and then in the final couplet, they actually have to part. 
Having that final couplet isolated on the page emphasizes that feeling of being alone after a long time being part of something. In that way, the structure of the poem emphasizes the meaning, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, too. Beyond arranging your stanzas, there are so, so many ways of laying out your poetry on the page. And as with all poetry, and indeed all art, there's no right or wrong choice here for how to lay out your poetry. It's really up to you and what you feel best serves the poem that you're working on. So here I'm going to lay out some of the options for layout. Uh, but this is not an exhaustive list. There are so many different techniques out there. Some poems look like a single block of text with roughly the same length lines, and this is where the poet has just paid attention or used a set poetic form just to try to make sure that the lines are all roughly the same length and it appears more or less like a rectangle. These are two examples of sonnets that look like that from Don Patterson's book, 40 Sonnets. The same effect on a grander scale can be achieved with prose poetry, which doesn't use line breaks or stanza breaks at all, but is effectively formatted like prose. And again, this is a, another example, another poem from Don Patterson's 40 Sonnets, one of his more experimental sonnets, which you can see on the text looks like a novel, or like any piece of prose. Another option is to play around with indenting lines, either with a fixed scheme, which is consistent all the way through the poem, or just varying up indentation all the way throughout the poem based on your own stylistic choices. You can see examples of both of those techniques here in Kieran Hodger's wonderful book, Cosmocartography. And as I've said earlier, when you're considering how to lay out your poem, have a think about what kind of layout would best to reinforce the meaning, the tone, the voice of your poem. Can form reinforce function? One of my absolute favorite examples of this is Joe Bell's wonderful poem, How to Live on a Narrow Boat, on the right hand side here. As you can see in this poem, it's very narrow. There's only one or two words per line. And so the narrowness of the poem, the shape of the poem on the page, reinforces what the poem is talking about, a narrow boat. Poems like that function as concrete poems, or pieces where the visual is integral to the poem's meaning. You can check out my full workshop on concrete poetry from season one of Return to Form, linked up there in the eye. All right, with all of those fabulous options on the table for how to lay out your poetry, it's time to put even more options on the table and talk about punctuation. Yes, I know that probably sounds boring as heck, but bear with me here. The way that you punctuate a poem can really add to the sense of it, the meaning of it, and there are so many cool stylistic choices that you can make here. First off, to capitalize or not to capitalize. You may have been taught in school to automatically capitalize the start of every line of a poem, and Microsoft Word will usually do that for you. This was the traditional way of capitalizing poetry, the way that Shakespeare and Keats did it. Today, and this is a broad generalization, there will obviously be exceptions, but today what's more common is to only capitalize the starts of sentences like you would do when writing prose so that not every line of poetry will begin with a capital letter. Or if capitalization is stressing you out, you could do away with it altogether. The American poet E.E. E. Cummings famously wrote much of his work in lowercase, as well as intentionally using grammatical errors for stylistic effect. You can see those techniques on display here in his much-loved poem, I Carry Your Heart With Me, I Carry It In. And that segues me beautifully into the joyous, very popular world of grammar. So how does grammar work in poetry? The simple answer is that, well, there is no one simple answer. Many poets will correctly use grammar in their writing, so that if theoretically you were to take away the line breaks, you could just read a poem like you would read prose. However, there is a lot more grammatical flexibility in poetry than there is with prose, and a lot of poets bend or just chuck away the rule books. For just one example of a stylistic use of weird grammar, Emily Dickinson famously loved using M dashes. These are the long kinds of hyphens in her poetry. You can see that here in her famous poem number 479, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. 
If that were written as prose, you would usually have periods or commas. It would be a little bit hazy. But Dickinson just does away with it and uses M dashes. There are so many different techniques for how you can use grammar, whether you make up a special style of your own, and lots of examples that I could show you, but instead I'm going to say this. The most important thing about formatting and punctuating your poetry is simply to be consistent and to be thoughtful. If you're not going to capitalize, don't capitalize. Don't mix and match randomly, unless you're doing that to specifically support the meaning of the poem at that point. If you want to make up your own grammar rules, groovy, go for it. But do try to stick with them all the way through. Bending the rules is awesome, but you don't want to bend them so far that your reader actually finds it difficult to understand the poem, unless you're trying to alienate them, in which case, fair dues, go for it. Just always consider how form can reinforce function, how the punctuation choices that you're making can echo, support, underline the meaning of your poem. The most powerful example that I've ever read of punctuation choices emphasizing meaning in poetry is in Paul Minette's 1988 collection, Love Alone, 18 Elegies for Raj. This is a beautiful and heartbreaking collection of elegies that Paul Minette wrote for his partner Raj as Raj was dying from AIDS. This poetry is a howl against illness, death, injustice, grief, and it lacks all punctuation whatsoever. It's just blocks of text with phrases running into each other. This chaos makes it hard to read, hard to understand. And it communicates to the reader the inexplicable, logicless nature of death in one's prime, of losing the one you love. Manette himself said of the form for these elegies, I want them to allow no escape, like a hospital room, or indeed a mortal illness. I wanted a form that would move with breathless speed. And that's just one very powerful example of how poets can use structure to support, to reinforce the meaning of their work and to convey certain moods, certain tones to the reader. So as you're reading poetry and as you're writing your own, don't just pay attention to the words of the poem and the meaning of those words. Also pay attention to how they're laid out, how they're formatted, how they're punctuated, and consider how all of that structure affects the poem more broadly. And that's it for this episode of Form Fundamentals. I really, really hope that this episode has been helpful for you in understanding poetic structure. As always, if you guys have any questions after watching this video, please pop them in the comments below. I am more than happy to help. And stay tuned, next week we will be releasing the third and fourth episodes of Form Fundamentals focusing on rhyme and on meter. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking it, subscribing to the channel, and ringing that bell icon so that you don't miss any of our other upcoming videos. You can directly support our work and receive so many wonderful perks by signing up to our Patreon for as little as one pound a month. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and happy writing!